issue or well, well welcome to lab life with the air force research laboratory hi i'm michelle and i'm kenneth today we are talking to ryan helbach a bow tie wearing interpersonal engineer who is innovating the way afrl does business in three two one ryan welcome to the podcast Thank you guys so much for having me on. Uh, I've been listening uh, to the last couple and I, I've loved it so far. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. But I do have to say I'm kind of disappointed in you today. You're not wearing a bow tie and you normally do. So, you, you know, it's funny over the weekend, I was like, I, I need to wear a bow tie today. I need to wear a bow tie today. This morning I woke up, didn't even cross my mind. So <laughs> I am very sorry to disappoint. Okay. <laughs> I, I, probably disappointed at our listeners too, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had quite a few questions from our listeners uh, surrounding your bow ties. So I just want to field one for you first. Um, Eric Aelia, a friend of yours, asked, um, has the bow tie helped or hindered your career? Yeah, so that's a that's an awesome question. And actually, um, surprisingly, it's actually helped me. So kind of going into my, my career with AFRL, uh, when I started with AFRL, I was doing hypersonic uh, propulsion research. Uh, so studying things and developing technologies that could fly five times the speed of sound. So things going really, really fast. And I was, I was doing that, but I was also participating with the Junior Force Council, which is a, a group of more junior folks that are new to the government, new to the Air Force Research Labs. And we had a, a little lunch session where the top leader or civilian for the Air Force Research Labs came through and we had lunch with him. And um, I got to sit down and talk with him for, for 10, 15 minutes. And somewhat as a joke, we invited him. We were going to have a happy hour the next day. And so we invited him to come out to the happy hour. And what would you know, but he, he showed up the next day. And um, so didn't think anything of it after that until about two or three days later, my boss comes to me and says, what were you doing talking to this guy? Because he had sent an email after the happy hour and said, Find out who that bow tie guy is. Oh wow! I That's want, a good title. I want him to work for me, and so it it led to this whole career opportunities that really has led to where where I'm at today. So it's it's fascinating how a simple little thing like a bow tie can lead to really a career change um, and, and a whole set of opportunities that I never knew existed. Well, that's amazing then. So you're saying that this bow tie, has that been a nickname that's kind of chased around with you then, the bow tie guy? So so it's funny, for a while I started, I started wearing ties and I was like, oh man, this is kind of stodgy and <laughs> old. I'll go even stodgier and older and do bow ties. And, and you know, I started wearing them and people were like, oh, what are you doing wearing a bow tie? But it helped me stand out. It helped me develop my own personal brand, if you will, that folks may not recognize who I was, but they knew the bow tie guy. And so, so especially being junior in my career, it was one way to help me as I developed my career and developed uh, within my research field. Have you seen that kind of catching on then? Are you kind of a spokesperson for like, <laughs> hey guys, we should at least have a bow tie day kind of thing? So it's funny, there's, there's a couple other folks within AFRL that consistently wear um, bow ties. In fact, there's one guy that wears a bow tie every day. I don't, I don't wear a bow tie every day, but there's one guy that, and we always joke that we're gonna get into fisticuffs when we run into <laughs> each other about, about who's wearing the better bow tie. I wish probably just do a poll, like who wore it better. Like, <laughs> Get a picture of you and him side by side. No fists, yep. obviously. Yep. But. <laughs> and, and then as well, you know, I feel like maybe one of these days we're going to be wearing the exact same bow tie. And then, and then you problem. know it's gotten awkward. <laughs> so um, one other question about the bow ties then. Uh, do you have a favorite or one you like to bring out for special occasions? Yeah, so, so I have... I have a few that I like, so I, most of them I tie myself. I do have a couple clip-on bow ties, I will admit to that. <laughs> but I actually have one, uh, some of my uh, friends, after uh, as I was leaving hypersonics and moving into my, my current role, they gave me this bow tie that had uh, this uh, vehicle that I worked on. It was called the X-51 Wave Rider. It was a scramjet engine demonstrator. So there's a lot of nerdy words in there, but in essence, it was a, a vehicle we got to test fly back in uh, 2010 to 2013. And so on the bow tie, they had stenciled the X-51 all over it. And it was, it was so cool. I, I thought that was the coolest thing. I wore it a couple times and I was like, I shouldn't wear it too much. I might, you know, <laughs> might, might lose the X-51s off of it. Yeah, I was wondering how they sent it through public clearance process too for the, the stencil. Well, I can only imagine the paperwork that went into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. So uh, going back on what you mentioned beforehand with the bow tie, you mentioned your own personal brand and sticking out. Um, you have a pretty unique position here at AFRL. We mentioned it earlier, the chief entrepreneur. Can you explain that? Yeah, so, so I have a fantastic position. I like, I like to say I have probably one of the best roles within AFRL. So 
people always say, what the heck is an entrepreneur? I actually had, um, I was in a meeting with some senior leaders and they're like, did you make up that word? I did not, it's actually in the dictionary. Um, so, so it's a term that was kind of developed in the 1980s, but it was taking this idea, and I think most folks are familiar with entrepreneurs. So, so you know, when you think of entrepreneur, you think of uh, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, right? Um, an entrepreneur is really kind of that similar idea of somebody that's starting a new product, a new service, or, or, or doing things differently, kind of disrupting the paradigm, but they're doing it within an, a large organization. So I am a entrepreneur within the Air, Air for All Research Labs, the Air Force Research Labs. So to help visualize that better for our viewers, what's an example of something you do or your kind of day-to-day? -day? So I really have uh, a lot of different roles and a lot of different responsibilities for what I do. So one of the big things that has that uh, taken up a lot of my time right now is this idea of uh, Air Force pitch days. Um, so I think most folks are familiar with uh, Shark Tank or American Idol. One of the big things the Air Force has been trying to do really in the last uh, couple of years is to better engage uh, with startups and small businesses. So, so there's a lot of uh, perception and, and somewhat reality that the government moves slowly. Probably never heard that before. <laughs> um, but uh, when you have a very small startup that needs to move quickly, that has a new technology, how can we be responsive and be moving at the, the speed that those small businesses do? So the idea of the Air Force Pitch Day is uh, to, to bring in startups. Uh, so we did our first event in New York City in March. We brought in uh, 60 uh, startups and small businesses and they made their, their pitches for their technologies to, to the Air Force. And we made decisions to award or not award uh, right there on the spot. So a company would come in, give a five minute pitch. We'd ask five minutes of Q&A to them and then we'd make a decision to award or not award a contract, and then they would walk out of the room, we'd sign a contract with them, and we'd give them their first uh, initial payment. So literally all this happening in one day. And, and so largely I was uh, leading that up, again, kind of disrupting this paradigm of, oh, it's gonna take half a year to do some of these things. Can we do it, can we do it in a day? You were even paying people with PayPal, right? That's correct, yeah. So we, oh, were, wow. we were using, uh, it's called a, a government purchase card, but really it's a credit, credit card credit debit card. And so we were using, companies were using PayPal or um, Square, the Square readers. So we actually had something really funny, uh, well, not funny at the time, but funny now. The bank flagged us that we were doing fraudulent activity because we were, in essence, during that day, we were, we were putting out about two, $2.5 million on these credit cards. And so, of course, the bank software sees this and it's like, we were, we were in Times Square, in a, in a hotel in Times Square, and somebody's spending millions of dollars on the government credit card, what's going on? And it, and it started shutting us down. And so there was about an hour where we were panicking, trying to make a bunch of calls. And it was, it was funny, because we, we were talking with the bank representative, and he was, just, he was so apologetic about it. And we were like, no, no. That's exactly what we want to happen. We just, we just didn't necessarily want it to happen in this instance, but um, everything worked out fine. So, so it was an awesome experience. It was uh, very energizing for the government folks and energizing uh, for the startups and small businesses. That's amazing. So even the like the bank algorithms didn't think the you could award that fast. Oh no, no, they did not. They were not set up with that paradigm. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that could be alarming. So is that a major part of your job then, finding, like you said, issue or areas that you could really shake up, kind of like with the contracting or helping give people money they need quicker? Yeah, so a perfect example, uh, when I talk about this stuff and when I bring up with what an entrepreneur does and, and kind of compare that to an entrepreneur. So an entrepreneur is, is really working kind of in the, the innovation space, so, so developing new products, new processes, um, new services, or even uh, addressing or changing policies. So when I think about innovation and entrepreneurship, I think about it from kind of those four lenses. So, so a perfect example of that is, is Uber. So when, when we talk about Uber, Uber is really, it's a, it's a product, right? It's also a service, but it's also really on the policy side as well, because it's truly, a, if you really look at it, it's a taxi service, right? But they were able to get around a lot of the legislation and a lot of the policies that were in existence for taxi services prior, prior to, to them starting. They were able to operate in this gray space for a while, long enough that rules and laws started to be able to be changed. So a lot of my job is actually spent 
uh, not only developing new products and services uh, within AFRL, both internally for, for our scientists and engineers, but also externally as we engage with, with companies, uh, but it's also looking at the policies and, and the, the processes that we do things. Can we do things differently? Just because it worked back in the 1980s doesn't necessarily mean it still works today or it still should be the acceptable paradigm today. So that's very, another big part of your position then is making sure that you're actively, we are adapting as AFRL. Correct. Yeah. So I, I'm a, a, a firm believer that you can look at it in the commercial world and you can look at it within the defense world that the, the research and development landscape is changing. It's changing. And uh, you see it in the commercial world with, uh, with organizations moving from, from what's called in-house research, but basically owning and, and uh, paying scientists and engineers and, and doing the work internally to, to more external collaborations or to, to actually going and setting up facilities in, in areas where technologies are occurring. Um, so, so maybe placing an office out in Silicon Valley or in Austin or in Boston or, or even just getting your folks out there and, and better engaging with those, those environments. So, so you see that shift occurring in the research and development world and you, you definitely see it within the defense world. And, and so it's been fascinating to be part of that and, and to, to help move AFRL forward, really move it forward to that 2030 uh, and 2040 and beyond. Yeah, is there anything that excites you most about what you see in the future? Yeah, so, so, so the biggest thing that really excites me is, is the fact that I do see things changing with, within AFRL and within the DOD. And, and largely for the better, right? There, there are some, sometimes there can be some frustrations uh, with the government and the speed and the processes and some of the, the structures. But at, at a high level, I see a general trend to, all right, we need to do things differently. We need to be more agile. We need to be adaptive. Um, we need to be more responsive and move at the speed of, of businesses and startups. And, and so, I'm very hopeful for the future, and I, I just love, I love working with, with startups, I love working with our scientists and engineers and seeing all the amazing technologies that, that get developed within the research labs. But then as well, I've been afforded the opportunity to see so many different aspects of the Air Force. I mean, the Air Force to me is just mind-boggling, right? You have all these different aspects, whether you have some, some functions that are like UPS, right? They're, where they're handling logistics and they're delivering supplies to, to all around the world. You have hospitals and you, you have aero evacuation where you're moving people on airplanes that are, have been injured. We're flying satellites all the time and we're, we're do, dealing, doing uh, things in the, the cyber world. And it's just, it's an amazing organization. It's hard to wrap your mind around it all, but, but it's just, there's so many opportunities within the Air Force. So you mentioned how a lot of this innovation takes place within AFRL and without, but you're working on helping change minds. So how receptive have people been to a lot of these bold ideas of pushing forward? Maybe if I could flip that question on, on the two of you. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about how you guys started your podcast. And the reason I bring this up is because there was a lot of people that had been talking about, oh, we should do a podcast. AFRL should do a podcast. AFRL should do a podcast. And it would never leave the meeting room. It would never go beyond that. There was a point a couple months ago, myself and, and um, my buddy uh, Mark, we were literally sitting in a room and it was just the two of us in this little room and we had a cell phone and we were recording ourselves doing a podcast, a quote unquote <laughs> podcast on the cell phone. But the thing was, it never matured beyond that, right? So tell me a little bit about how you guys got started. And okay, I mean, right now I've been with AFRL for about two years and over the first you know, year and a half, they, we'd had those same conversations. Like you'd be in a meeting with a bunch of other communicators and they'd be like, we should have a podcast. Or I'd talk to a scientist or an engineer like, hey, why aren't, aren't we doing this? We have stories to tell. But for some reason this January, I have a monthly kind of breakfast meeting with someone else that does, uh, that does social media for the headquarters Air Force Material Command. So the level above uh, Air Force Research Laboratory. And she'd created a podcast about contracting, the contracting experience, and she said, there's an appetite for a contracting podcast. There's definitely an appetite for a scientist or science and engineering podcast and te about technology. So that was January. So we're just like, okay, we'll do it. You know, she had kind of the the structure set up of, you know, who who can record. We got, you know, we got Chris with us right now recording this podcast, and he's been with us through this journey. And we just lined up guests we thought that had important messages, and we interviewed them, and Chris edited them, and we just ran with it. 
you know, why I wanted you guys to tell that story is because there's a huge difference there between the folks that, there was dozens of folks that were like, oh, we should do a podcast, but nobody ever took the action took the action and saw it all the way through until you guys started doing that, right? And so really when I think of an entrepreneur, you guys were entrepreneurs because you took the idea and you actually did something with it, right? You created something that wasn't there before. You were innovating, right? And yes, you, you leveraged what was out there, but that's what innovators do. They take it and they iterate on it. And that's, it's, it can be a very small iteration or it can be a very large iteration. Yeah, and touching on what you said earlier, it was once the idea was pitched, like you mentioned, it happened pretty quickly, Michelle, yeah, like once like, we got it rolling, so people want to hear know? this, yeah. it's just a matter of getting yourself out there. Yeah. And touching on that as well, um, so this being kind of an amazing thing that happened to us, we didn't expect it quite to happen as quickly as it did, and it's turned into something great. How did you kind of get around becoming chief entrepreneur? How did you visualize this awesome idea and get to it? So I wish I had the forethought that I had visualized this and, and planned this out, but it's somewhat exactly back to the podcast of, I just started taking actions, I started doing things, and one thing led to another led to another. So I had mentioned that I had uh, worked at the, the high level, uh, I spent a year working at the high level for the Air Force Research Lab executive director, and, and after that I had gone back to hypersonics, and I was, I was somewhat tainted, if you will, of I had been exposed to the whole spectrum of the Air Force Research Labs and the amazing things that, that we do within the organization. And, and I started, in addition to doing the hypersonics, I started doing what I called my side hustle of kind of trying to pull like-minded folks together and say, hey, what, what could we do differently within AFRL? What kind of things could we try to truly make this a better place and, and, and really, really take it beyond what it is currently? And, we just started doing it on, on the side and eventually through a number of things that didn't work or didn't, didn't take off, we eventually started getting to a few things that worked and, and eventually that kind of built and built and built until it got to a point where I was approached and said, look, we love what you're doing. We want you to do it full time. And I said, well, that's great. Let me create my own job and let me create my own <laughs> job title and uh, I'd be happy to do that. And so that's, that's how the chief entrepreneur uh, came about and the, the idea of that role. So it was never, I never had the goal when I was starting out or even, even when I was starting to do this that I was going to be the chief entrepreneur. But it was really kind of, you know, as I took one step, it led to the next, to the next. And, you know, I won't, I won't lie, there was a lot of points where it was like, what are we doing here? This is not working, we're, we're frustrated, we're, we're running into to problems, it's not working out quite as we had planned. But, uh, you know, eventually it's really persisting and seeing it through that has kind of allowed us to do uh, one thing to the next. So, so a couple of good examples of that is uh, we started out with this group. I mentioned, you know, there was a group of us and we, we called it Shift, shift AFRL. Uh, so the idea was could we shift AFRL into the future? Could we take some of these ideas and experiment and then push it into the future? And so there was a number of things that really kind of came out of that. So one of the things was we stood up a program called the Entrepreneurial Opportunities Program. It was, it was basically the ability for our scientists and engineers to do a sabbatical looking at laying the foundation to start a business around some technologies or intellectual properties uh, that was resident to, to the Air Force Research Labs. And that program, once we got that going, that then led to the next opportunity of, well, can we actually take our folks and can we embed them at, at Google or Facebook or other innovative companies and, and expose them to not only the research that they're doing, but also the cultures. And so that led to what we called the intellect uh, exchange program, basically this idea of could we exchange our scientists and engineers for, for short durations. Um, and then that led to this idea of could we do, could we do a, a maker space? So could we actually set up facilities near where our, our scientists and engineers are located that they could do some small scale prototyping and experimentation uh, very rapidly? Uh, and then that idea led to, could we do innovation hubs? Could we actually set up physical locations that were outside of the base that were engaged with, with startups and small businesses, and even large businesses as well, but, but outside of the traditional framework, kind of behind the fence, if you will. And so it's just one thing led to another led to another. No, I was just thinking, so you've created all these tools and platforms and programs that help shift our, our thinking with an AFRL to be, or facilitate innovative thinking partnerships. What do you do to keep yourself innovative like and cutting edge? 
you say that I've I've created all the I've largely it's been a team of us to, to oh, make sure, all yeah. of this all of this happen and so I, I like to joke with with my wife that I'm not really that innovative like I'm not truly an innovative person but when I hear a good idea or when somebody comes with a good idea or I do see a problem that I think I could address or, or try something different then I go do it so so I always kind of laugh when People are like, oh, you're so innovative. I'm like, no, I'm just kind of an engineer and I see problems and I want to try and solve those problems or do things differently. A lot of it is uh, kind of getting fresh perspectives. But then as well, you guys mentioned with your, your podcast as a perfect example is take a precedent that somebody else has done and mimic it, model it, and, and adapt it to your situation. For the most part, largely that's what I've been doing is, is taking what's been proven already or is demonstrated some success and then try it uh, a variation of it. And digging into that, um, how was being an engineer beforehand really helped you now kind of tackle problems? As an engineer, my belief is that you're solving problems. You're solving complicated, hard problems. And, and for a lot of engineers, that means doing a lot of math and a lot of uh, programming or, or computer-based work. For me, it, it, it means solving problems as it relates between people. Right, so, so a lot of the things that we have started have really occurred between the interplay of, of different personalities and, and, and different people that have helped support and help enable them to occur. So, so as I try and solve a problem, I don't necessarily use mathematics. I try and leverage the partnerships, the relationships, the alliances that I can to make things happen. Um, so it's, it's really, more than anything, it's working with a huge team of of, of other folks and, and tapping into the brilliant people that are out there already. It definitely helps to be outgoing in a position like this. It's so, so it does, yeah. so it's, <laughs> yes, it definitely does, and that bow tie helps because then people are like, they oh, know that guy. it's that bow tie guy. <laughs> you know, just get cold calls to the Air Force Research Lab. I was talking to this bow tie guy, oh, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You could actually get a bow tie with your name on it and start handing oh, that out as business oh, cards. Man. Like, oh, man. Chief entrepreneur bow tie. <laughs> See, and, and you ask where I get my innovations, it's happening right there. He's going to go home now and like order die cuts of like, bow ties, stamp his own cards. I mean, yeah. I think it's brilliant, so if you need a first test subject, I'll walk around, see people People catch on. It, it stands out and people will remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I love it. So uh, kind of tying it all together then, um, for people kind of, let's say, in the position you were at beforehand, kind of looking for um, that new innovative push or something fresh, kind of like that uh, chief entrepreneur position, um, what advice would you have for them to kind of follow their dreams or something they're excited about? The big thing I was told very early on in my career was, look, when, when, you're, when you're doing a job, no matter what, there are parts of it that you're gonna love. You're gonna love doing it. And there's gonna be parts of it that you just have to do, right? So do the things that you have to do, do them well, but then try and spend as much time as possible doing the things that you love, right? And if you do the things you hate decently and you keep trying to do more and more of the things you love, eventually you'll, do, you'll get to a point where a majority of your time you're spending doing things that you love. And yes, you still have to do a lot of the, the, the stuff that makes you roll your eyes and, and groan when you get out of bed on Monday morning. But, but you get to a point where, yeah, I, I love what I do. Yes, there's struggles with it, but I love what I do. And, and I truly feel like I've gotten to that point. And, and so even within hypersonics, when I was, was not the chief entrepreneur, um, I would even do that within the hypersonics. When I was starting out, I was kind of put into a, kind of a couple different roles. And, and one of the roles I, I just, I dreaded, and it, it, it was it was tough on me, and so so it, you know I I did it, and I did it well, and eventually they got to the point of all right, well we've got this other opportunity. Would you want to do this, or we want to grow this role? And so it allowed me to kind of hand off the things that I didn't like in order to move to the things that I liked. So we did have a few fan questions for you then at the end, uh, kind of following what we did with Eric earlier. So uh, the first one we kind of had was uh, one from Kevin Rusnick, our local historian. Uh, he was wondering, how can you leverage AFRL's 100 plus year history to promote AFRL's image in and out of the lab? So, so that's a perfect example. And, and I'm a firm believer of kind of going back to, to this idea of science and engineering. It really is um, a series of 
experiments. It really is a series of experiments. And, and what AFRL has done over the last 100 years is just continuous experiments. And so, you know, when I talk about AFRL and where I talk about where AFRL should go, it's taking that experimental ment methodology and mentality and, and moving forward. And it's, it's not only the, the physical experimentation, I mentioned the uh, flight experiments that we did with hypersonics, but it's also the experimentation with, with programs and structures and, and ways that we engage with, with other organizations and with other, other entities. So, so when I think about AFRL's heritage and where it needs to go, that experimentation has to be at the core of it. Um, and we can't be afraid, people say, oh, what about failure? What about failure? Well, failure is nothing more than just a learning process, right? So you can look at failure of, oh, I, I tried to do a podcast and it didn't work and I failed. Or you could look at it of, I tried to do a podcast and here's what I learned from it. Well, I didn't have all the tools that I needed to, to truly take it and move beyond that. Or, well, I learned these couple things. I'll, I'll remember that, I'll write that down, and I will move on, and I will try another experiment, right? So it's just that experimental uh, approach. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, Boldly think, pushing forward makes sense. Yeah. Well, I think Kevin will like that plug. <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, Dan Berrigan asked, what is the small business office doing to help AFRL connect with startups around the country? Yeah, so that's a that's an awesome question, and uh, as I mentioned, I, I love working with, with startups, um, just the, the energy that they bring, and and as well, the opportunity space that's there from a government perspective of we have so much room for improvement. Uh, I had mentioned earlier engaging with the, the Air Force pitch days and, and how we're doing that. We're also uh, uh, standing up a group called the, the Air Force Ventures. And so the idea is, can we do some things that are similar to that Air Force pitch day? Can we try and expose our folks and, and train our folks internal to, to the Air Force that uh, be able to bring some of those startup methodologies, but then as well uh, show uh, the, the impact that some things can have. Um, you know, a perfect example of that is for a startup, that cash flow is critical, and, and so if, if things get delayed, uh, that can have a huge implication. Um, so, so we're doing the Air Force pitch days. Uh, this week is the, the Dayton uh, Startup Week. Uh, yes. So we have a, a defense, uh, defense focus. Uh, track this week, and so it's engaging in, in those environments. But then as well, it's also getting out and, and, um, and, and engaging in, in um, uh, tech hubs such as Austin or, or even uh, Columbus, Ohio, or Cincinnati, um, and, and getting outside of the fence and engaging in ways we haven't really before. If you're a small business, an entrepreneur, someone with just an idea, and, and they have an idea that they would like to work with the Air Force, how do you recommend they start? Yeah, so the best way to start is really a combination of things. So number one, uh, in the startup world, they talk about customer discovery. So the idea of customer discovery is that I've got a new idea or a new technology. Well, I should go talk with the folks that actually are using that technology or have that problem. So, so one of the easiest things that companies can try and do is, is, is to do some of that customer discovery, engage uh, with, with Air Force entities. And there's a number of ways that the Air Force gets out and engages with, with communities, whether it be conferences or those innovation hubs that I mentioned. But then as well, uh, we also encourage companies to put in their uh, ideas through uh, a program called the, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR. And so uh, right now it's, it's three calls a year, and there's basically a number of different ways you can put, put in your proposal, but we have uh, one of the things that I've worked on is an open innovation topic. It's basically saying, give us any of your ideas that fit anywhere within the spectrum of the Air Force mission. So whether that be air, space, or cyberspace, anything that might fit within that. Put in your proposals and we'll, we'll review it. Some of them are, are kind of out there. Yeah, we'll get the, the flying saucer and, and the <laughs> things like that. Um, but some of them are things that we hadn't necessarily thought of. You, you know, the ideas that, that come in uh, through that open innovation, it's, it's been phenomenal to see over the last year as, that, as that's developed. It's important to get that widespread, so like you mentioned, you can kind of focus down and maybe pick, pluck out one of those technologies Correct. and say, yeah, of course, let's check this out. Yep, definitely. It was teleportation, right? <sighs> I, I can't wait for teleportation. <laughs> hey, I, I am say, very excited. Did you know anything? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, the last question we had here was kind of a fun one. Wanted to see how you felt with uh, Matthew Polini's question. What is the best dad joke you've heard or come up with recently? Oh man, so so I have a whole whole slew of dad jokes that I could, <laughs> could uh, go through, and and so uh, the first one is uh, how many apples grow on an apple tree? I, I'm thinking of an exact number. Give me yeah. like, okay. Let's say let's say 200 apples. No, all of them do. Uh, I've never heard of an <laughs> apple bush or an ash, a, apple shrub. So. That got go. me. Yeah. All right. So, so you, uh, maybe a couple more. Please. And yeah, you yeah. Can edit. Yeah. Um, so did you hear about the, the joke about uh, paper? I hadn't heard it, though. No. Uh, don't worry. It was terrible. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, so I like to tell my dad jokes. Uh, he laughs. There you go. That's <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Uh, one, one last one for you. Yeah. So if you're in, a, you know, you're in the Apple store and uh, you're getting some work done on your iPhone and somebody comes in and steals a couple, uh, couple iPhones, uh, are you an eyewitness then? <laughs> See, I actually really like these because I love puns and weird jokes. Oh, these are great. Oh, there you go. So, and that's the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Love these jokes. Ryan, thank you for joining us and teaching us about bow ties, how to stand out, and how to innovate. And thank you guys so much for having me. I really enjoyed this, and I'm so glad you guys did the, the podcast. I actually got it off the ground. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it. And to keep up to date with future and past podcasts and to check us out on social media, make sure to see us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And make sure to stay curious. Logging off.